This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. In the mid-2000s, Wes Anderson really began exploring new territory compared to his earlier films. The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou, The Darjeeling Limited, and Fantastic Mr. Fox each moved beyond his established comfort zone while still retaining his signature style. In this video, we'll examine how he uses type in these films to express characters and places, and how his relationship with type changed over this key period. This is part two in a series, so if you haven't seen part one, I'd suggest you start there. But if you're all up to speed, let's dive right into where in his previous film, The Royal Tenenbaums, Anderson used Futura to create a strangely uniform typographic world, in The Life Aquatic, type is used to underscore the differences between the protagonist Zisu, played by Bill Murray, and his rival Hennessy, played by Jeff Goldblum. Zisu is erratic, insecure, and unkempt. His crew is a gang of misfits and reluctant interns. Hennessy is detached, cool, and above it all, and his crew stands at attention like naval officers. The the production design of their respective ships drives home this dichotomy. Zisu's ship, the Belafonte, is all baby blues and wood veneer. Hennessy's ship and Sea Lab are all clinical white and stainless steel, like an operating theatre. As opposite as the characters may be, both are equally obsessed by personal branding. Zisu's branding feels handcrafted and comfortable, but also driven by ego and a deeply rooted personal insecurity. Hennessy's feels more corporate and business-like, while equally ego-driven. This branding, of course, extends to the typography the pair use. Zisu uses Futura with offbeat, handwritten elements that exude a worn-in vintage appearance. Hennessy applies his name stenciled on all of his equipment to deter theft. Operation Hennessy's branding is built around Handel Gothic. Even the geometry of the two fonts is opposed. While Futura is circular, Handel Gothic is built from squares with rounded corners. Handel Gothic is a great choice for this role. Originally created in 1965, it enjoyed a peak in popularity through the 1980s and 1990s when it was used in sci-fi shows like Star Trek Voyager and Deep Space Nine. That connotation of futurism and scientific detachment is the perfect foil to Futura's retro charm. The Life Aquatic was a box office flop when it debuted, and despite the undercurrent of casual homophobia aging quite poorly, it's developed a cult following over the years. Steve Zissou's image and obsession with personal brand have clearly been partly inspired by oceanographer, explorer, and inventor Jacques Cousteau. In fact, the resemblance was so clear, the film's distributors preemptively offered the Cousteau family $200,000 not to sue. Despite being an obscure figure to folks my age and younger, it's clear he had an impact on Anderson's generation. Of typographic interest, Cousteau produced two long-running documentary series for PBS in the United States between 1968 and 1982. Both used Futura Bold in yellow all caps for their opening titles, which wasn't much of a stretch for Anderson to echo on screen in The Life Aquatic. There's also an early scene where Zisu is asked to sign several of his movie posters, which bear a strong resemblance to the vintage posters for Cousteau's films, though not a direct stylistic copy. A custom outlined style of lettering is used throughout this film from the opening to the closing credits. While mostly based on Futura, there are in fact many subtle differences. The A is quite a bit narrower than Futura and with a lower crossbar. The C and S terminate much more abruptly, giving the overall character set a narrower profile, making the perfectly circular O and Q stand out more. This is the first time we've seen Anderson pushing to expand on the Futura family. To me, it seems like an attempt to add more versatility to the typeface he's relied on so heavily to this point. The film still feels quite rooted in Anderson's signature retro-modernism, with both the locale and time period left deliberately obscure. The fictional Air Kentucky's logo evokes the styling of various airlines during the 50s and 60s. Yet the branding for the abandoned Hotel Citroën seems also rooted in 50s kitsch, but has clearly been long out of commission. There's a frequent use of typewritten or at least monospaced fonts throughout as another anachronistic touch. Overall, The Life Aquatic feels like Anderson broadening his vision to tell a bigger scale story, but also feels clearly stuck in his influences. Cousteau and vintage Italian cinema, 50s and 60s Americana. His next film would leave almost all of this behind. 
The Darjeeling Limited tells the story of three brothers on a train journey through India, trying to reconnect and deal with their family issues. It was filmed primarily on a real train as it traveled through Jodhpur in Rajasthan. The film's protagonists are very much the self-absorbed Westerners, giving very little thought to the culture around them. Probably not a good example to follow, so acknowledging my own ignorance in Indian vernacular lettering and design, I reached out to talented designer and lettering artist Chandan Mahimka. I am a designer from Mumbai. I have traveled Europe extensively and I have a solid Western design influence in my work. And my upbringing in Mumbai, traveling in India has brought another dimension to the work that I do. We spoke about the lettering used in the film, starting with the decorative style used for the posters and on the titular train itself. It's very distinct with the letters divided and alternating between solid color and hollow outlines, almost reminding me a bit of a Battenberg cake. The hollow aspect, at least, felt kind of reminiscent of the type treatment from Life Aquatic. Was that just my projection, or was this actually a well-known and common decorative lettering style in India? Uh, no, this is too stylized actually. The quirkiness that he's got with filled letters and open letters, even though it's creative, it doesn't seem out of place. Especially when you see Darjeeling Limited written in English and Darjeeling written in Hindi, which is Devanagari script. That sign painter has painted the Hindi following the English character of open and filled letters. It's very well done. So the style is not traditional, but it is the design work of Anderson's team. Of course, this makes sense on reflection. By breaking up the positive and negative space in the letters, it would cause huge legibility issues for a train which you might need to identify in a hurry. But there was another design element that Chandan pointed out. With the four elephants, it's kind of a Western sensibility. The first imagery that comes is Rajasthan because it's culturally so rich. The forts, the people, the colorful costumes, the festival of Holi, the palaces and the beautiful peacocks roaming the terraces of those palaces. So this elephant is also a part of the palatial art from that region in India. What about the use of English though? Was that only done for the benefit of international audiences? English is kind of our second language. Every state has its own language. We have around 24 states and that becomes your mother tongue. But the most common language used to communicate in business, in education, other than Hindi, which is our national language, is English. On the exterior of the train itself, the other information is also painted by hand, as is quite common in India. But where does this style of lettering come from? The branding of Darjeeling Limited does not have like a direct connection to the train typography, which is again uh, the colonial hangover that we have for almost a century now. All the lettering that you see outside the train, explaining the second class compartment, the first class compartment, the ladies, the gents, all of that is Jill Sands. Not in its totality, but some part of it feels like that. Of course, Gil Sands and the related Johnson Underground are emblematic British sans serif fonts. Johnson was used for the London Underground, and Gil Sands, which followed, was adopted as a typeface of British Railways. Both of these typefaces took influence from early sans serifs called grotesques, which were developed for advertising in the Victorian era. It makes sense then that the British colonists not only brought the railways to India, but also their lettering styles. Keeping within the train, we see a few shots of selected signage through the film, including this banner in the compartment where Jason Schwartzman's character shatters the door. It is all hand-stitched and embroidered. These are not painted. Like the major festival in India is Diwali. And we do use Happy Diwali signs outside our door, written in our own mother tongue. And in each state, the colors would change, the script would change because the mother tongue changes of that person who's hanging it. So it almost feels homely to me. And uh, many times our mothers would embroider, cut those letters and stitch them. So it would be a part of a kind of the family heirloom. And this is completely Indian and uh, very well done again. I'm sure they had an Indian design consultant. The other uh, stencil style is also very, very common, not just in long distance trains, but also in the local suburban trains. And these guys are pretty professionals. I'm sure they have not taken education in art, but somehow because of long years of doing it again and again and again, they have fine-tuned it to a level which is easy to the eye. Moving outside the train itself, a pivotal plot point happens in a local market where Adrian Brody's character buys a cobra from a snake vendor. The sign outside the shop looked a little strange to me with the word snakes conspicuously large and on a separate sign 
underneath the larger one without English text. I wish I would have had a badge of typography detective. It should be a job. Snakes is definitely a similar shape and style to Darjeeling Limited. So the blue is the open part, the red is the filled part of Darjeeling Limited. Other notable lettering we encounter in the Indian context include the phone booths used throughout the film with the label PCO STD. PCO means it's a public telephone. Within India, if you call somebody, it's STD. Between 2005, 6 and 7, the mobile phone is well reached, but some parts, it was relevant at that time, which has disappeared suddenly in the last decade. We also get a colorful example of vernacular lettering with the phrase, Horn OK Please, on the front of the bus the brothers catch later in their journey. So Horn OK Please is pretty common on public transport especially because it's a giant vehicle, it's pretty common to write horn OK please so that you would honk and let them know that you are behind them. The words are authentic, the style in which it's painted, the, the 3D nature of those alphabets, the shading that is as authentic as it can be and I don't think it's done for the movie because they've shot on an actual bus. Finally, we come to the closing credits, which are unusual for two reasons. Firstly, until this point, Wes had always typeset the closing credits in a very particular way, always in Futura with the surname in all caps. This was in homage to some of his early influences as a director and the way their credits were formatted. I'm glad he firstly didn't use Futura in the most dominant places because that would have just completely killed the feel. And also he's not got completely Tish India, which you will see many times with the truck art, graphics and uh, letters. So he's not got completely Tish. He uses graphic design so very well. The credits are in a strange custom font that appears nowhere else in the film. It's an extremely uneven typeface with mismatched cap heights and kerning errors, which gives the connotation of imperfect handwritten signage without being an overt cliché of India. A central theme of this film is letting go of the baggage of the past. While not the most subtle metaphor, it's extremely visually effective. Whether conscious or not, it is telling to me that the baggage happens to have the most prominent use of Futura in this film. Certainly, this movie marks a new confidence from Anderson to move beyond simply mirroring his early influences. A huge thank you to Chanda Mahimka for taking time to speak with me and sharing his insight. There's so much we spoke about that I couldn't fit in this video, so an uncut version of our interview will be available for my supporters on Patreon. He also pointed out a little Easter egg hidden for readers of Hindi in the snake vendor's signage. The proprietor's name is written beneath the word snakes. There is a style of surnames in India which is directly related to the business that they are in. Pakshi means bird, Wale means person. And the funny part is his name is Popat Bhai. Popat Bhai means parrot brother. Popat Bhai Pakshiwala is the person's name. So that's a pretty funny sign there. Very good sense of humor. You can find Chandan on Instagram at C underscore Mahimka and his website Mahimka.com. Before we move on to our third and final film, it's time for a short ad from the sponsor of this video, Private Internet Access. Region-locked content can be hugely frustrating. In the UK, where I lived and purchased my streaming subscription, Fantastic Mr. Fox is available to stream right now. Unfortunately, since I've moved to Sweden, I'm now locked out. Or at least I would be without a VPN. Private Internet Access reroutes your internet traffic through an encrypted tunnel via any of their global servers in over 75 countries. Along with keeping your online activity private from your ISP and government sensors, you get a reliable connection and unrestricted access to content from all major streaming services, no matter your location. PIA never records or stores user data, and their no-logs policy has been proven multiple times in court. Alongside dedicated IP address options and 100% open source code that anybody can inspect, PIA is an industry leader in transparency. It's available for all major platforms for desktop, mobile and more, and you can have up to 10 connections from the same account. Use a link in the description or pinned comment below to help support this channel and get 83% off. That's three years of service for just over $2 per month, plus two months free. Backed by a 30-day money-back satisfaction guarantee. Thanks to PIA, and now on to our third film.
While he had experimented with stop motion in The Life Aquatic, Fantastic Mr. Fox was the first fully animated feature from Wes Anderson. And it is truly a visual feast with an abundance of small details and nuances to pour over. The character design is charming and quirky and the environments overflow with eccentric details that reward repeated viewings. The 87 minutes of runtime required a staggering amount of labor from skilled artisans and an unbelievable feat of coordination from the team involved. So, it's with some reluctance that I must confess that in the area of typographic choices, this one perplexes me. Let's start with the good stuff. There are several brilliant aspects in some of the major set pieces, particularly the squirrel moving vans in the early film with their charmingly mismatched vehicle signage, the inserts of Mr. Fox's column from the Gazette with its Windsor-inspired headlines and faux hand-drawn typesetting, and my favorite set piece, the town, both pre- and post-fire. The town's typography is the most authentically English part of this film, which was adapted from an English writer's work, ostensibly set in England. It's the only segment of the film where we see typographic realism. All of the various high street signs seem mostly convincing. However, it would be rare to see a British pub have a sign reading pub, not free house or public house. And laundry is more likely to have been laundrette. It definitely feels like a change for the benefit of an international audience. But overall, the film feels distinctly un-English, despite the source material and being filmed in London. This is not an inherently negative thing, but it's evident not only in the American English phrasing on signage and the American voice casting for the animals, but I think that one typographic choice really underscores this geographical disconnect. Helvetica. We previously talked about how Anderson honed in on Futura to the exclusion of basically all other fonts in the Royal Tenenbaums. It was used in situations where it wouldn't be used in reality for the sake of the film's aesthetic. If Futura was the default font in Tenenbaums, then Helvetica fills that role in Fantastic Mr. Fox. In fact, the only place we see the signature Wes Anderson Futura, bold yellow in all caps, is on the poster. There are a small number of background uses of Futura in the film itself, but it never steps onto center stage. For everything else, there's Helvetica. We see it on screen for non-diegetic titles in this faux 3D extruded yellow and amber treatment. We see it on buildings, signs, books, documents. As thoroughly saturated as Tenenbaums was in Futura, Mr. Fox is in Helvetica. So why Helvetica? It's a Swiss typeface, but to me it will always evoke the American brands of the 1970s to 2000s where it saw peak usage. It's the typeface of the New York City subway, American Airlines, American Apparel, CVS, and the North Face. What it does not connote is Britishness. Strangely, the typography in Darjeeling Limited feels more British, even though it's through a colonial filter. This is why, from a typographic standpoint, the film leaves me puzzled. Wes Anderson is not the type of director to overlook the details. Watch any behind-the-scenes feature about this film, and you'll hear stories of his meticulous eye for detail, even down to replicating cups and saucers he saw in a particular French cafe. If he has this level of detail to a minor prop with passing use, surely there must be some intent behind choosing Helvetica, which appears front and center over and over. That said, despite his reputation for fastidiousness, some part of my brain must be even more pedantic. It bothers me, to an unreasonable degree, that the feature titling has not been properly masked in Photoshop. See how the edges of the extruded shadow have a hard, light-colored band on a dark background? That's improper masking, which would have taken a few hours at most to fix. And this close-up shot, the book spines are clearly some may say unforgivably pixelated. This feels like my papyrus moment. I know what you did! But that, with great effort put aside, the question remains, why Helvetica? I can only theorize, but I think two factors are at play. Number one, Willy Wonka. The most famous Roald Dahl adaption before Mr. Fox has to be Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the good one with Gene Wilder. That was filmed in West Germany with an American actor in the lead, and the results are culturally ambiguous. Fantastic Mr. Fox is directed by an American who was living in Paris at the time of production, and I can't help but feel there's some unintended echoes of that atmosphere in this Dahl adaption as well. 
Two, this movie in some ways marks a dividing line. Because after this film, never again would Anderson use Futura in a project. What little there is in this movie seems to be there almost by accident, and the use on the poster seems likely to be playing it safe branding-wise by the film's distributors. Don't forget this was the first time Wes had helmed an animated movie, and they wanted a way to signal that he was the creative mind behind the project. What better way to quickly communicate that than by using his signature typeface? But really, it feels like Anderson had outgrown Futura. And across these three films, we can see a progression. In The Life Aquatic, he tries to push and expand the versatility of Futura by using a bespoke outline version. In Darjeeling Limited, we see a remix of this outline and solid lettering in a unique display style, but not in Futura itself. And by Fantastic Mr. Fox, he knows that he has to move on, but feels unsure about where he's going next. And to me, Helvetica is a reflection of that indecision. It's the choice that's no choice. It's plain vanilla. Not to disparage Helvetica or vanilla, but they have that unique default quality. Honestly, I think that Wes Anderson's use of Helvetica tells us more about how he feels about Futura than how he feels about Helvetica. And those uncharacteristic sloppy details seem to back up that interpretation. Join me in part three, where we'll look at how his typographic style evolved after the Futura breakup. Things are just starting to get interesting. Special thanks to my supporters on Patreon who keep videos like this coming. My name is Linus, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.